Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Teresa Rickard. Um, on behalf of all of us at Jones & Roth, I want to welcome you to today's small business webinar, 2023 Filing Updates for Form 1099. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from two of our very own small business advisors, Jim Wyatt and Jenny Odens. We're thrilled to have you here today. Uh, Jenny's going to walk us through some brief updates, and then um, the two of them will be ready to tackle your questions. And this is really a Q&A focused webinar, so we want to really give you an opportunity to ask any and all questions that you might have about both preparing and then filing your Forms 1099. So please, you know, beginning now and throughout the presentation, go ahead and submit your questions in that questions uh, section of your GoToWebinar menu. I also want to mention that today um, our slides are available for you to download as a PDF in the handout section and we will have some links and so those are links um, that you can click on in the, that PDF. All right, so before we get started, just a quick intro to our firm, Jones & Roth. We are one of the largest CPA and business advisory firms that are headquartered in Oregon. We serve our clients from offices in Eugene, Bend, and Hillsboro. And we function with a structure that revolves around specialized teams of industry and service areas. And so our experts in those teams work year round, not just at tax time, to help businesses, nonprofits, and individuals achieve their financial goals. And what we really see ourselves as is a partner for our clients um, on their path to achieving financial and operational management excellence. So I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today. We are hearing from two advisors on our small business team. Um, our small business team works with small to mid-sized businesses. And um, today we have Jim Wyatt and Jenny Odens with us. Uh, both are business consultants on our small business team and their experience really spans all the way from startups to well-established businesses. They are also QuickBooks Pro Advisors and so bring a wealth of knowledge in terms of bookkeeping and accounting. Jim and Jenny, thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to hear from you. Thank you, Teresa, for the introduction. Yeah. We are a group of uh, small, uh, we're a group of staff members here at Jones and Raw in the small business group, specifically focused on the bookkeeping and accounting needs of new startup businesses, as well as establish, as assisting established small businesses. We love working with our clients and assisting them on their pathway to success. If we can be part of your journey, please do contact us. And now, Jenny, if you'll start with 1099s. Thank you, Jim and Teresa, and welcome to everyone here today. Thank you for joining us on Halloween. So if you've seen our 1099 video tutorial series, then you'll know that 1099s are information forms that have to be issued to vendors and contractors who you have made payments to in the course of your business. Today, I'll be focusing on the four most common types of 1099 forms. 1099 NEC, or non-employee compensation, 1099 MIS, or miscellaneous, 1099 DIV, or dividends, and 1099 INT, or interest. There are several other types of 1099s, but these are the ones that I'll be focusing on today. I'm gonna start by talking about information gathering, and it's really best to start doing that now. Asking yourselves four important questions now. Who did you pay? What was the payment for? How did you pay them? And what amount did you pay them? Is really important because these four questions determine whether you need to issue a 1099. And if you do need to do so, what kind of 1099 is required? To answer the question, who did you pay? You'll need to collect W-9s for each of your vendors, unless you already have a W-9 on file for them. The W-9 will show the vendor's legal entity type 
and their taxpayer identification number, or their TIN. The vendor's entity type is important because some entity types are exempt from 1099 reporting, which I'll talk more about. You also want to think about the purpose of your payments. Uh, for example, did you pay for rent or for services? And you'll want to think about the method used to make those payments. Check, ACH or wire transfer, credit card, debit card, PayPal, Venmo, just to name a few. And in many cases, you may have paid your vendors with a variety of methods. You'll also want to think about the amount of payments that you made to those vendors. You'll want to look back at your records, though, after December 31st when it comes to the amount of your payments, because the total amount will include any payments made in November and December as well. This year, the IRS is planning an update to Form W-9, and they have currently published it in draft form only. I've included a link here that you can find um, in your handout, which includes all the links I'm going to talk about today. W-9 form, and it was last updated October 2018. So this is the one you'll still be using until the IRS publishes the final version of the one they're working on now. And you'll want to pay special attention to box three, because this is the box where the vendor tells you what their federal tax classification is or their entity type, such as a partnership or a C corporation. This is the proposed draft from the IRS. And there's a new section called 3B. It says, if you checked partnership or trust estate on line 3A, and you are providing this form to a partnership, trust, or estate, check this box if you have any foreign partners, owners, or beneficiaries. And so you'll want to check that box, whether those foreign partners, owners, and beneficiaries are direct or indirect. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about backup withholding, which is something that's required by the IRS if you do not receive a W-9 or a TIN from your vendor. So if the vendor doesn't supply their TIN, per the IRS, you have to withhold 24% of all your payments to them. Then these withheld amounts need to be deposited periodically with the IRS. And then finally, you report both the backup withholding amounts and the amount that you deposited on annual form 945, which is due January 31st. If you receive a notice, a CP2100 letter from the IRS that shows a name TIN mismatch from a prior year, you must send a B notice to the vendor to request corrected info from them. If they don't submit that corrected info within 30 days, you must do backup withholding on any future payments. And a really good policy here, the best way to avoid any backup withholding is not to pay a vendor until you first collect their W-9. If you have already paid a vendor and they do not provide you with a W-9, then per the IRS, you should begin backup withholding immediately on all future payments that you make. So returning to the question of vendor type, the W-9 shows you the federal legal entity type or classification of that vendor. You must issue 1099s to vendors or subcontractors that you made payments to in the course of your business during calendar year 2023, but there are some vendor type exceptions, including corporations. And that includes LLCs that are treated as C-Corps or S-Corps by the IRS. An LLC or a limited liability company is a state classification, not a federal one. LLCs may or may not be classified as a corporation with the IRS. So again, you'll wanna look at section three closely on that W-9 from your vendor. Another exception is rent payments to real estate agents or property management companies. 
But if those rent payments are paid directly to the real estate in, real estate owner, then those payments do go on a 1099. Other exceptions include tax exempt organizations, tax exempt trusts, and US government and foreign governments. And there's exceptions to the exceptions. Not all corporations are exempt from reporting. Attorneys are subject to 1099 reporting, regardless of whether they are a corporation or not. If you pay an attorney for legal services, it goes on a 1099 NEC. However, if there are gross proceeds that you've paid to an attorney, those go on a 1099 miscellaneous box 10. That would be, for example, a judgment awarded by the court. Also, medical and healthcare payments must be, must be reported regardless of corporation status. These payments are for medical and healthcare services, not for health insurance and not for payments to pharmacies. An example of medical payments that would be reportable would be a dentist paying a vendor for lab services. So that lab, regardless of whether they're a corporation or not, would need to be issued a 1099. Another far less common example is fish purchases paid in cash for the purpose of resale, which gets reported on 1099 miscellaneous box 11. The next thing to consider is payment methods, because this also will help you determine whether or not you need to issue a 1099. Payments made via cash, checks, ACH, and wire transfers are reported on 1099s. Payments made via electronic third parties are not reported on 1099s. This would include debit cards, credit cards, PayPal, and gift cards. Instead, those electronic payments are reported by the merchant, for example, the credit card company, via a 1099-K, and you do not need to report it. However, some electronic third parties have more complicated scenarios, such as Venmo. So if you make payments via Venmo, if those payments are made to a business account, if that's what your vendor has, a business account, then no 1099 is needed. If your payments are marked or tagged as business transactions, then no 1099 is needed. But if those payments are not tagged or marked as business, and if they're made to a personal account, then a 1099 is required. Also, you may make your payments using Bill.com or Zelle. Bill.com and Zelle are not considered electronic third parties for the purposes of 1099 reporting. So it depends how you've made your payment within those two platforms. If you pay via check within Bill.com or Zelle, a 1099 is required. If you pay via ACH transfer within Bill.com or Zelle, same thing, a 1099 is required. But if you pay via credit card or via virtual credit card within Bill.com or Zelle, then a 1099 is not required. The next thing to consider is the purpose of the payments you've made, because this determines the type of 1099 that you'll need to issue. Services and non-employee compensation gets issued on a 1099 NEC. Several categories get issued on a 1099 miscellaneous, including rent, medical payments, and royalties. Interest goes on a 1099 INT, and dividends are reported on a 1099 DIV. For other types of payments, you'll want to look at the IRS instructions. You'll also want to consider the question of goods and services. If you make a payment in order to purchase goods or products only, then you do not need to issue a 1099. But if you make a payment to a vendor for both goods and services, a 1099 is required, 
and includes all goods used by the vendor to perform those services. You'll also want to consider the amount of the payments you've made um, to each otherwise eligible vendor. The minimum payment threshold is $600 or greater for 1099 NEC forms and for some categories on the 1099 miscellaneous form, such as rent and medical payments. This means that if you pay that vendor $500, during the calendar year 2023, you would not need to issue them a 1099. Other types of payments may have different thresholds, such as royalty payments, which have a $10 minimum threshold. You'll wanna uh, consult the IRS instructions again for more information. And an important note here is that 1099s cover the payments made in a calendar year, in this case, 2023. 1099s do not cover invoice totals. So in other words, they cover the amounts actually paid, not the amounts owed. Something to work on now is software preparations because that will help you determine which vendors you need to prepare 1099s for. You'll want to mark your vendors as eligible in QuickBooks um, or the software that you're using until you know that they are exempt from 1099 reporting. You'll also wanna set up your account mapping, which is a topic we cover in our video tutorials and we offer a step-by-step -step guide there. You'll also wanna review your expenses on your profit and loss report, most likely now and then again after December 31st. And you'll want to make sure that your reports are showing what has actually been paid, not what has been invoiced, meaning that you'll want to set your reports to cash basis. Once you've prepared your 1099s, there are some changes to be aware of in terms of federal filing. This year, meaning tax year 2023, if you're filing more than 10 information forms, you must file them electronically. Before the threshold was 250, so it is a major change coming from the IRS. And note here that information forms include W-2s for your employees, as well as 1099s. So for example, if you have eight employees and you need to issue only three 1099s, you now have to file all of them electronically. If you have 10 or fewer forms and you still want to file via paper, you need to purchase specially formatted blank forms and not just the 1099s, but also form 1096, which acts as cover page for the IRS. Uh, and the reason you'll need to go out and purchase official versions is that they use red ink that is not standard printing red ink. And I've included a link, which again, you'll be able to find on the handout of the slides. Um, for ordering directly from the IRS. But also you can find these forms with office supply companies. If you go ahead and e-file your 1099s, you're gonna have two options this coming year. IRIS is a new platform, stands for Information Returns Intake System, and it will accept forms from the year 2022 and later. And a benefit of IRIS is that you can download and print recipient copies of 1099s to provide to your vendor. The IRS has said that in general, it's going to be a much more user-friendly platform. But FIRE will still exist, and that stands for Filing Information Returns Electronically. If that's what you've used in the past, you can continue to use it this year. Either system requires something called a TCC or a transmitter control code, and instructions for obtaining one can be found on this website, the IRS filing one here at the end of the slide. It, um, it may take up to 45 days to obtain, so if you don't have one yet, you'll want to put in that application now. Next, I'm going to talk about Oregon iWire because you will most likely need to file via Oregon as well as federally. Oregon still does not have a reciprocal agreement with the IRS, 
which means that Oregon does not accept information provided by the IRS. The majority of states have entered into an agreement with the IRS where the IRS sends them their 1099 data, but Oregon is one of a handful of states that does not accept data coming from the IRS. Instead, they require you to file via their own platform, Oregon iWire, all 1099s with either the payer or recipient having an Oregon address. And uh, one thing to note here is that only 1099 NEC and 1099 miscellaneous forms need to be filed via iWire. 1099 interest and 1099 dividend forms do not need to be filed via iWire. I've included a link here to their main page they offer instructions and a downloadable spreadsheet under the resources section, which you can use um, to fill in your information and then simply upload to them. Oregon does not accept paper filing of 1099s, no matter how many you have. One last thing to note is that QuickBooks Online does not offer Oregon filing of 1099s. They do offer federal filing depending on your subscription type, but not state filing. And here's the upcoming deadlines to be aware of for 1099 year 2023. So January 31st is the first major deadline. 1099 NEC, IRS e-filing and paper filing deadline. It's also the deadline for Oregon iWire e-filing of 1099 NEC. And for recipient copy mailing for both 1099 NEC and 1099 miscellaneous. For paper filing deadlines, forms must be addressed, postmarked, and mailed, but not necessarily received by that date. And you'll want to note here that a Pitney Bowes postage meter or other postage meter uh, date stamp is not an official postmark date. And in Eugene, it's our understanding that unless you take your forms to the Springfield Post Office by Gateway Mall, those forms may not be postmarked until they reach Portland the following day. The last thing that's due January 31st is Annual Form 945, which is used to report backup withholding and deposits that you've made throughout the year. February 28th is the paper filing IRS deadline for 1099 MISS, 1099 DIV, and 1099 INT. There is actually a February 29th in 2024, but the IRS draft instructions still say the 28th, so you'll want to go with the 28th for now. And then the third deadline is April 1st, 2024, because this year, March 31st, falls on a Sunday. And that is for IRS e-filing of 1099 MISS, 1099 DIV, and 1099 INT, as well as 1099 MISS Oregon iWire e-filing. I have scratched the surface here today, but I've also included here some resources to consult for further information. And you'll note that this third link is for IRS draft forms. This is because the 1099 forms themselves, as well as the instructions for 2023 are still in draft form. So this is where they can be found for now. You'll wanna check back on the IRS website for when they release the final versions. And I've included the 2022 instructions in the meantime as well. And now I'm gonna go ahead and open up this webinar to Q&A which Teresa will be moderating for us. Thank you, Teresa. Yes, well, thank you, Jenny, uh, for walking us through a great recap and in and, and pretty short amount of time too, I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, we do have questions coming in, so let's get to them. Uh, the first question for you both is uh, about location. So for services provided by someone, who is outside the US, should a 1099 be sent if the services are performed in the US? And if the services are performed outside the US, how do those get handled differently? Oh, 
Jim, I think you might be muted. That can, be, a, that can be a complicated uh, uh, question, depending on the status of the business that's originating overseas, even if you're being provided the services by a United States service provider. Um, I actually think if, if you're interested in um, very clear instructions, you could email me and I'll provide you with those resources. It's pretty much outside the scope of this conversation and it is very detailed. Um, my email address, if you'd like to send that question to me, is uh, J Wyatt, W Y A T T, at jrcpa.com. Great. Thank you for that, Jim. Um, how about this question? I own several properties in town. I made payments to my property manager so she could pay a contractor for repairs. Do I have to report those payments on a 1099 to the property manager? I'll take that one, Jim. Yep. So in that case, if the property management, sorry, if the property manager has management oversight um, over the work that the contractor is performing, then she's the one who would issue the 1099 to the contractor. So you would not need to issue a 1099 to your property manager. I'll add that this is a question of third party payer. Um, there are several circumstances where this will arise, specifically in rents, what Jenny said, but then also in other areas, such as let's say a bank is making payments to a contractor in a real estate construction situation. It's technically your money that the bank is dispersing, but because the bank has control over it and they have an interest in the business as far as liens are concerned, they're the entity that needs to issue the 1099s and not you. Great. Okay, how about payment method? If you reimburse a contractor for supplies with a separate check other than a check for their services, does that amount need to be included in box one of 1099 NEC? Jenny, the, the, I, oh, go ahead, Jim. I was gonna say, if the um, parts uh, and supplies are incidental to the contract for the service that the uh, business is providing you, even if you issue it in a different check, it needs to be included on the 1099 because it's incidental to the service being provided. If it's for some reason parts um, or supplies um, purchased that are not related to that particular product, that particular service, um, then you wouldn't have to include it in your 1099. Okay, so it sounds like if it's related to the actual job they're paying the contractor for, then it would be included. Yes. Okay. That's right. And just as an a example of that, if you pay a contractor to retile an office bathroom, you would need to report on the 1099 the payment that you made for the tiles as well as the labor and installation, even if you pay it as two separate invoices. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Here's a, another question for you. Do I have to file all my Oregon and non-Oregon 1099s via Oregon iWire? I can go ahead and take that one, Jim. So it's not all 1099s that have to be filed via Oregon iWire. It's only 1099s containing an Oregon payer address and or an Oregon recipient address. And also, you're going to want to keep in mind that only 1099 MISS and 1099 NEC need to be reported via Oregon iWire. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Um, how about paying an employee cash to clean the office after hours? <clears throat> Do they issue a 1099 for that? I'll take this one, Jenny. Paying the employee to do work that's not necessarily related to the job description still doesn't change the status, the relationship between you and the employee necessarily. 
for that employee to be considered an independent contractor would mean that they basically had their own side business that they were trying to make a profit at, that they had the control over. The question between independent contractor and employee is a complicated um, decision. It used to be that an independent contractor was considered to be independent if you weren't managing the details of their work. It's become much more extensive and the definition is in the labor standards from the federal government. The assumption on the state level and the federal level is that the people that you're paying, unless you can demonstrate very clearly that they're independent contractors, that they, it will be assumed that they are employees and need to be taxed on their earnings in that manner. So this is a gray area and I think it would be best to err on the side of considering that person to be an employee. And I'll just add to that, that you can find some more details in the IRS publication 15A. Okay, great. Uh, travel reimbursement for contractors, would these be included on a 1099 if they provide receipts? Jenny, you want to take this? So if they provide receipts, and it's a reimbursement, I believe that would be considered part of the 1099 that you would need to report. If it's if it's separate, um, and you can and you can sort of delineate the separation then you do not need to, to include those expenses from your independent contractor. If they are expenses that are um, accountable, uh, an accountable expense is where you're provided receipts. Um, that, uh, it, it, but if not, then you should include it on the 1099. Uh, and I just wanna also clarify that this situation we're talking about an independent contractor some people ask if employee um, expenses should be 1099 and the answer is no if they're your employee those expenses come under the employment status and they need to be regarded as to whether they'll be placed on the w-2 or not and that's a whole other area and again beyond the scope of this but an employee's expenses never appear on a 1099. And so are you <clears throat> are you comparing the receipts for travel um, in a similar way to the supplies that might have a receipt? Is it related to the work that they're doing for you or is it, are you saying that because there's a receipt, it does or does not need to be included on the 1099? Because there's a receipt, it does not need to be included in the 1099. It's not a question of whether it's incidental to the work or not. Mm -hmm. Can I just follow up with my own question on that for clarification? So uh, it, it back on that example of the supplies, if there's a receipt for the supplies, is that, a, you handle that in a similar way? No, it, it's treated differently. Okay. The question with supplies is, are those supplies being used in the service that's being provided? Mm -hmm. right. So if, you, if someone comes in, as Jenny said, and is doing tiling, well, their work, their service is installing tiling. And so you need to put on the 1099 the, what you paid them for the, the supplies and the tiles. But the expenses are different. Travel yeah. expenses yes. are not considered. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Great. Okay, here's a question for you. Um, this person works for a nonprofit. Each month, they give each employee a reimbursement for business use of personal cell phone. Does that have to be reported on the W-2? And if so, what box? Well, that's a W-2 question, and we're focused on 1099s. 
Right. I can tell you though that cell phones, the business use of a cell phone is considered, um, you don't have to prove it up with a bill that shows the calls that you made. Yes, you may reimburse someone for the cell phone use as long as it's reasonable and it does not need to be reported on a W-2 because you're reimbursing them for an expense. All right. Um, what about paying payroll garnishments to an attorney or creditor? Do these get reported on the 1099? Jenny, would you like to take that or would you like me to take that? Uh, I'll have you take that and then see if I have anything to add to it. Thanks, Jim. This, I think, is a question between the difference between the NEC form and the miscellaneous form and what's called gross proceeds to an attorney. When you're making payments to an attorney and you're not paying them directly for services that they're providing to you, such as writing a contract, reviewing a lease, but you're making a settlement payment, then you would include this on a 1099 miscellaneous because you don't know what's broken out in the garnishment. You know, oftentimes there's an arrangement between a lawyer and the client that they'll, they'll get so much uh, a percentage of whatever they recover. You don't know what that, that deal is. So you provide on 1099 miscellaneous, I believe box six, you provide the total amount that you've paid that attorney, whether they're a corporation or not. If it's for a service that's particularly, like I said, that attorney is performing services directly related to your business. They're writing up a lease for you. Um, they're reviewing a contract for you. That goes on the 1099 NEC. Um, and that's reported as attorney's fees. This is an area that is very um, confusing sometimes because both forms say attorney's fees, but it's the miscellaneous that is the gross proceeds. It's the NEC where they're directly making a work product for your business. And I'll just add, I believe it's 1099 miscellaneous box 10. That's where those gross proceeds would be reported. Thank you. Great. Okay, this question is, what about the new reporting requirement for independent contractors and the state of Oregon? Do you have any info regarding this? I wonder if that's part of what you covered on one of your slides. I don't think that we have uh, updated information yet on this area. Okay. Uh, we'll make it available on our website when we've had it and had an opportunity to review it. Um, particularly with the state of Oregon, um, sometimes the revisions tend to come in the 12th hour, <laughs> sometimes even in early January. Um, but we will update our um, website as early as we can. Okay, that sounds good. I do know that whenever we do post a new blog post to our small business um, blog, that that gets emailed out to everyone who is subscribed um, to our to our small business um, category. So um, if you received an invitation to register for this webinar, you would also be getting all of those blog posts. And if you want to subscribe, I mean, you're not subscribed, you can go to our website down in the footer and click subscribe. Good. Uh, all right. Um, let's see. Uh, how about is, let's see, I can't get my vendor to send me their W-9. What do I do? So in that situation, the IRS has given some guidance. And per the IRS, you must begin backup withholding of that 24% immediately on all future payments that you make to that vendor. And you report the amount withheld on both forms, there is an area for you to report withholdings. So let's say that this vendor is a 1099 NEC vendor. In box one, you put the amount 
that you paid them. And in the withholding box, which I believe is box three, um, you would put the amount that you withheld back. Uh, and then they use that almost like they do a, a W-2 uh, in order to, they can have it refunded in part or whole, depending on their tax situation. Um, it is not a comfortable situation to be in, to tell your vendor that you're only going to pay them 76% of what you owe them. So that's why we suggest that with your opening uh, work with them, uh, either your contract or, or bid, you make it a requirement that they provide you with the W-9. If you don't do the withholding and the um, recipient doesn't file their taxes properly or owes taxes and can't pay them, you may be liable for the amount that you were supposed to withhold that you did not. So it is putting you at risk. Great, another reason to just ask for that upfront as your standard protocol, save mm -hmm. yourself that time. That's right. And I'll just add that not, not only do you have to report that withholding on the 1099 NEC or the 1099 MIS, um, as Jim was saying, but you also have to report it on that annual form 945, which the IRS uses to reconcile throughout the year. I think it's a good thing to think of that W-9 is like a W-4 from an employee. It's sort of telling you their status. And the 1099 is sort of like a W-2 to an employee. It's telling, it's telling the government how much money you gave them. And if you had to withhold, it's informing them just like a W-2 does. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, um, our final question here is a around if 1099s need to be issued for lawn maintenance or computer maintenance services. So computer maintenance services is definitely considered a service. So if they're otherwise eligible, then yes, they would receive a 1099. Um, for lawn care, it can be a bit more complex um, only business payments are subject to 1099 reporting. So if it's your personal lawn at your home address, you would not need to issue a 1099. The complicated part is something we've discussed before. Um, Jim was mentioning, you know, if that person could be considered an employee, then you may need to issue them a W-2. Um, so again, you'll wanna think about, are they an independent contractor or are they an employee? There are in um, the employee relationship, um, household uh, domestic employees, where you're not a business, you're the owner of your home and you're hiring a nanny, uh, you're hiring a housekeeper or you're hiring a gardener. In certain um, instances, they can become your employee. Um, but that's all within the purview of W-2s and employment law. And there is a publication with the IRS that deals specifically with household employees. And I would recommend that if you have household employees, um, that you um, just bring that up on the web and, and read it. It's uh, fairly straightforward on the first page or two, whether you are going to be liable for issuing them a, w, a W-2. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. We got through a lot of questions um, and I really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today and taking the time uh, with us. I know that uh, like you offered earlier, Jim, if, if anyone did have a follow-up question on our uh, small business page on our website. You can contact us. You can um, send a, an email to me at info at jrcpa.com and I'll get it to the small business team. Um, and we also have a couple of webinars coming up shortly that I want to make sure everyone knows about. On November 30th, we'll be talking about financial planning and tax planning from uh, a business owner's perspective. 
And then on December 5th, we'll have uh, the team from Lane County um, talking about personal property tax for businesses. So keep an eye out for those. Um, and we also post our recordings to our website. Um, if you register for a webinar, you automatically get an email with the recording as well. So Jim and Jenny, I just want to thank you again. Um, and a big thanks to everyone who joined us today. I really do hope that you have a better understanding um, of the process um, after hearing all of the questions and answers. And any final things that you want to share, Jenny or Jim? Uh, just please do reach out if you um, have a question that you weren't able to get to us today. Mm -hmm, great. I think Jenny did an excellent job of summarizing 1099 rules and regulations. At the same time, as Jenny said, she's just scratching the surface. There is a bulletin specifically about informational returns and specifically about 1099s, and they give you all sorts of scenarios of where you have to issue a 1099 very specifically. So if we were not able to answer your concerns or questions in this webinar, please refer to the IRS publication. Great, thanks to both of you. Take care, everyone. Have a great afternoon, and we'll see you at our next webinar. Bye-bye.